Okay. Can minimize this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Inshallah, we're going to continue our topic on Islamic inheritance. And tonight, inshallah, we want to look at continuation of what we had mentioned from last class. From our last session, what we had actually put together was looking at the importance of the Islamic inheritance and the will. And that is very important for us to take that into consideration, mean not just the word importance as we had put on the first page, but what we are looking at basically is identifying why we need to have a will. Why, what is the relevance of that? And that is not by our injunction. We had described from the last session that our will was, was there for us to benefit out of obeying the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tonight, inshallah, on page three, if we look on the page three, which we have opened up on the screen here, you would see it mentions that ayah there on verse 200, so at two verse 180. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a proclamation to us in the Quran and an injunction. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here in this ayat, he says that kutiba alaykum, just as the word was used when a person is fasting, Kutiba alaykum siyama. Kutiba alaykum. In this case, Allah says, I have ordained for you as I have ordained to those before you. Kutiba alaykum. Ida hadara ahadukum ul maut. When death would come to one of you or approach one of you, in taraka khayran. If ever you leave something of Worth and wealth in taraka khairan wasiyatan lil walidaini wal akrabin wa yuqi akwalan sayyidan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in that verse that this one should take into consideration in looking at that that you leave property, it shall be quest equally to parents and kinsmen. This is an obligation on the God-fearing. This is an obligation on the God-fearing. So Allah SWT says that this is an obligation, not just any, not any type of thing, but an obligation, not a choice, but an obligation upon us. Now understand what obligation means here. An obligation means to us that we have to fulfill the right of our will. We have to fulfill the right of the will. And fulfilling the right of the will here means that an individual who gets involved in a will, he gets involved in a will not because he sees it fit to suit whomsoever he wants to give an opportunity to, to get or benefit out of his wealth. But the objective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that it's an obligation upon the God-fearing is that the person who actually develops the level of Taqwa, piety, the person who looks at themselves and look at the condition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that this is an obligation upon us, that this is a, a means of us fulfilling the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it is for haqqan ala al muttaqin It's a right, an obligation upon the God-fearing. It's not just by the way, it is what the person who has taqwa, who has that fear of meeting Allah on the day of judgment. And we mentioned and a reminder that we were saying that a person going on the day of judgment, standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he looks to what he, he's going to meet on that day. What will be the outcome of that meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What will be the, the, the rights that a person is looking for to obtain on the day of judgment? And therefore this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us, that we ought to take into consideration, we ought to bear in mind that we are fulfilling an obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to ourselves, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That obligation now is binding upon us, meaning there's accountability. So we leave this world, two things can happen. One, we didn't prepare our will, 
So on the day of judgment, what do you think is going to happen? We will be ac held accountable for not preparing a will, for not giving instructions to our family on having our residue, our wealth dissolved, our wealth being put in the prospect that it is distributed, it is shared according to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That injunction must be always the underlining statement of an individual in their actions and in their words. That make no doubt about it, that I'm leaving this world and once I leave this world, you don't just take my wealth or fight over my wealth. My wealth is an obligation upon you to be fulfilled. That's why sometimes you take someone as an entrust that individual with taqwa and piety and let that person know that they are fulfilling a vow for the sake of Allah in fulfilling the rights of your will. And that's the right of the person who's alive. If you make a will and that individual does not carry out that will and that individual does not recognize that you are making it incumbent upon them that they fulfill this right, despite they might have dispute among themselves, despite that they may not like the idea that you are giving away or distributing your wealth in this manner, it's all well and good. They could think whatever they want, say whatever they want. But at the end of the day, that you have left this world and leave it in a condition that my wealth that Allah had entrusted with me will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the condition that Allah has ordained that my wealth must be distributed that he had given to me an opportunity. So in other words, a person will spend, utilize for the akhirat. But even what he leaves behind, must be also distributed for him to benefit in the akhirat. So the injunction relates to a period of time when this injunction relates to a period of time when no rules had been laid down for the distribution of inheritance. Thus, everyone was required to make this testamentary disposal of their property so as to ensure that no disputes arose in the family and no legitimate claimant to inheritance was deprived of his due share. And that is very important that we must clear that up and understand that the importance of holding on to our will or having our will being distributed in the way that it should be distributed is to ensure that the legitimate claimant to the inheritance will receive their due right. Because that right is not only settled here, you know, that right is also, if not settled here, will have to be settled in the life of the hereafter, meaning in Qiyamah on Judgment Day. If a person is deprived of what they are entitled to receive, then your obligation if not fulfilled here will have to be fulfilled here just like our salah just like these other obligations which we'll discuss a little a little later down when we're talking about the rights of the things that we have to look after whilst we are alive now allah does command you allah does commands you concerning your children the share of a male is like that of two females and this is mentioned to us here and if the heirs, the here, the ones who have to inherit of the deceased are more than two daughters, they shall have two thirds of the inheritance. And if there is only one daughter, then she shall have half of the inheritance. If the deceased has any offsprings, each of his parents shall have one sixth. Now, bearing in mind that this this ayah, uh, this verse. Right, describes these shares. I don't want to get confused with shares one six one two. We're not discussing that. What we are discussing at this point in time and looking at is the verse that Allah describes in the Quran the fractions here, the proportion of who will get what. This is not made up by me or by any jurisprudential scholars involved in the fiqh, whether it be the muftis or the great scholars telling us that these are the words. No, this is what Allah SWT mentions in the Quran. That if the deceased has any offsprings, 
each of his parents shall have a sixth of the inheritance. And if the deceased has no children and his parents alone inherit him, then one third shall go to his mother. And if the deceased has brothers and sisters, then one sixth shall go to his mother. All these shares are to be given after payment of the bequest, be it debt, funeral, that we made by any debts outstanding against him and the Quran. And Surah so Nisa verse 4 gives the clear indication to us that this ayat, this surah, Surah so Nisa, this ayat here gives us that Allah describes how your wealth should be given. Now, this is after we have already discussed about the one two, which is really the wasiyah that we'll give to or give to any type of charitable group or organizations or whatever it may be that we think that is will benefit out of our wealth that we have an opportunity to spend on. But even that is considered even after or after we have looked at all the debts and the requests of the funeral rights and those who are owed otherwise and so on. Those are the ones that we taken care of first and then whatever is left behind is then distributed. Now, what we get here is that Quran indicates this. So a person, let's imagine we are Muslims. Not that just we are imagining this, we know that we are Muslims. We confirm that we are Muslims. We read the Quran. We believe in the Quran. We convince ourselves that the Quran is the command of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us for our ultimate guidance and our ultimate success. We use the Quran to gain ultimate guidance and ultimate success and that means that the end result the quran will lead us in the direction that we benefit out of totally so in that respect when we look at the quran and we look at the benefits that one would get out of the quran subhanallah this benefit of the quran sometimes is ignored more than we think many people ignore the rights of quran ignore the right in relationship to inheritance. Why? Why well, I think we will ignore it and overlook it. What is so, so, so different to us in relationship to our wealth? That we, we think of Salah, when the time comes for Salah, we jittery, we restless, we, we try to perform Salah on time, we don't, we make, we make we do everything as I mentioned in the last class, but what is there that we would fight over these shares? that we would want to make, you know, all these wars that amongst families and members, and we can say there is so much, and no doubt, I'm sure that we would have seen this with our own thinking and our family members and so on. We would have actually know about these things. So we know exactly that these things do exist among family members, that these things do exist among family members. So knowing this, knowing that this is the condition of people, what is the underlying factor that deters or distracts us from actually fulfilling this obligation? It is the ayah that we had mentioned before in Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, verse 180, which says, this is for the God fearing those who have taqwa. Those who have taqwa will note that they will ensure and insist that each individual who is entitled based on the residue, based on the on the asoba, which we call in Arabic, the ones who are the ones going to be entitled to receive by precedent, how the Quran describes if this person is here or if this person is not here, if this one exists or if that one. Why Allah SWT didn't just straight, he put it very straightforward to all of us. He didn't have any other description or any underlying statement. Each one of these mentioned here based on precedents, some will be left off to fall off the grid by meaning that because of the presence of our other. But that is clear in the Quran as well. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanallah made clear these ayats for the one who would have taqwa. The ones who would have taqwa will ensure this. And, and, and we look at it and ponder a little more. Now mentioning this ayat here because we're not discuss, we're discussing shares and all the distributions just yet, but we are discussing the awareness, the, the consciousness, the, the reasoning why we should build this this environment of learning about inheritance, if not just learning all about shares, you know, well, why I need to learn about this? This is not for us to learn how to calculate everything, you know. 
This is more than just learning how to calculate shares. This is for us to actually come to the understanding that we need to propagate within our family unit, within our community and our Muslim brothers and sisters. More importantly, that our wealth, our wealth at the point of our death must be given as Allah wants it to be given and distributed, not how we feel. Now, moving forward, don't leave all your wealth to your husband or wife, ignoring Allah's guidance. And, and we just read it on top, what the Quran says. I know this might be shocking because sometimes we say, why, why would you want to do something like this? Why would you want to mention why don't leave all your wealth to your husband or to your wife, ignoring Allah's guidelines? Meaning, ignoring the verses of Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already established on how wealth should be distributed. So this says to us, in the Quran and Hadith saying, of his holy, of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it may make the will invalid. Why? Some people, we don't really take on that will. And say, well, if I don't take care of my wife or my husband and leave it up to them children, here I get nothing. And they might put him in a home or they might throw him aside and his own situation will not benefit him. And, and, and this is not something that we are saying by guess or I'm saying by guess. I have seen individual and I've seen individual from a personal point of view where that individual was left even though he had wealth even though he had wealth he had property they had all of these things this individual yet when this person becomes sick right they couldn't help themselves not even his wealth was beneficial to him because leaving don't ever the wife had onto himself and not entrusting it to who it's supposed to be given left him in a position at the end of it where he himself did not enjoy the benefit of even the wealth that he had at that point in time so you can see that there's some level of of weakness some level of loss in fact that a person might say all right give it to your wife or hand it over to your, your husband can only be done under consideration. What is the consideration? That your children, those who are entitled, let's say that they had children and they were around you, they are the ones who had entitlement to this wealth in the in will and also into consideration of the two that you might want to give in charity as well as wasia. Now, don't leave them out. Bring them to the table, let them know, listen, as a mother, as a father, if I were to die, these are the things that I have, or these are the things that I would have, and I would like this, this thing to be distributed, so and so and so. Would any of you like these things? And some sometimes the children are not as as as, as you say. I don't use the word greedy, but you know they they just living for just get to get wealth or to, to just benefit out of the parents. Some of the children will actually forego their shares. I say, no, nah, leave it to mommy or daddy. Nah, just give mommy everything, give daddy everything. It, it doesn't matter because he's he have to live here anyway, and we still have to look after him, so we don't need the wealth. But in that case, if any of them should die and the children forfeit their rights, then they said give it to the father or give it to the mother, then it becomes halal. It becomes permissible and allowable for that individual to benefit out of the wealth. So in that condition, the, 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 the getting ijazat of being able to have the jai's permission to do the action will benefit. So in that condition, we look at the rights of the individual being handed over to one of the parents and then it will become just to become valid it will be okay for such an action to take place and therefore in that way you will not find yourselves accounting for that on the day of judgment if however we said we leave it on our own with ignoring the rights of the children now they have already i don't give them everything they need already they don't, they don't need, to need these things to survive they don't need to be around these things they don't need to have these things I already give them, and I, I, I grew them up, I mine them, as you would say, take care of them, look after their needs. Now, at this point in time, 
what we look at is telling ourselves, you know what? Do I need to give my children anything more? No, what I leave here for me and my wife. I leave these things here for me and my wife. And, and, and I'm not going to give it to anybody else. I leave these things for my, me and my husband, as we would say in the other hand. But that is not how it is described in the Quran. No, it is not described like that. Therefore, we need to bear that in mind and say we, we can't do that. We can't do that without having consideration of what the Quran says and using that form, as I mentioned, of inviting those who will inherit and benefit out of it, give them the opportunity to say, okay, hand it over. If one of them may disagree, then it is up to you now, and you have no other option, but to actually, if that the demise of yourself or your wife, in that case, then the inheritance must take a course where this individual person must get their proportion of the share, beta one, six, one, eight, third, quarter, half, or whatever it may be, at this point in time, it can be done. If not, you can settle by agreement beforehand. Listen, you want your share, but I may not be able to give it to you because we want to give it to your mom. What the value of it is so much, I will be willing to offer you this. Well, are you willing to accept this as a negotiation? If they agree to it, you can pay them off beforehand and maintain the rights of it for your spouse, your husband or the wife as the case would be. All right, that will be Jai's as well. All right, but other than that, then it will have to take the mandatory law of the Quran and be fulfilled according to the laws of that. No other type of agreement can take effect. However, at the end of it, your wife being the lone survivor, the husband being the lone survivor, when the demise would come, then the ultimate result would be that that wealth, if not utilized by the husband or the wife, for whatever means that they would have probably wanted to utilize it for and left with nothing, then so be it. But if there is residue and there is wealth to be disposed of, then those same children will become the rightful heirs or the ones who will inherit that wealth and therefore it had to be distributed according to the Quran and what was mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, looking a bit further, looking a bit further at the other aspect, things that will make a will valid or invalid. What are the things that actually would make your will valid or invalid? Now, the valid part of the will is very simple because once you follow Quran and you follow what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has indicated and we, link, and we line up every aspect of what we are given and we distribute in that manner, then we have no worry, we have no, no sense of, of concern that something is missing or something is, is not right because we have taken the full guidelines according to Quran and Sunnah. In that respect, if we look at what the Quran tells us and we say, well, we are going along with that, then we are along the, a will that is valid. Now, what are the options that is going to cause our will not to be valid is of concern. That is what we have to look at. Those things that may cause our will not to be valid. So we're going to spend some time just discussing some of the things on our will. Remember, we're not formulating or putting the will together just yet, but we're looking at things or situations and conditions that may affect the validity of the will from my Islamic perspective, because we are bearing in mind that we are considering some options and that option must be according to Quran and Sunnah. And whatever is out of the Sunnah and the Quran, then the will becomes valid. So if an individual, one, if an individual makes, if an individual makes a wasiya will and then claims the entire will invalid or some part thereof, then the entire will become invalid. If he or she wishes, they can write a new one. And what are we talking about here? If an individual who's writing a will then claims the entire will is invalid. In other words, I'm giving this amount to this bill, to this property, to this orphan, to this, this individual who's going to study. I'm giving this amount of that and I was here. This is what I'm giving. And, and this is what I'm writing in my will as to the one third portion of it. When this time comes and the individual is fulfilling this right of the will, then at this point in time, 
he tells himself, listen, I do that again, you know. I am not distributing account to that will, and I, I consider that will invalid. Despite him having all what he have done, once he says that is invalid, meaning that it no longer can be utilized for distribution because of his being alive and proclaiming by means of words, and they are witnesses to it, then that will becomes invalid. No, a big question can be asked. The person can rewrite a new one, but the bigger question can be asked, if this wit of these, these witnesses to the will that was prepared claim that the person tell me that this will is invalid, then what happens? You know, I have seen situations, and this is not to, to identify individuals or people, but to just identify with you what happens with will at times, where a will was produced by one individual and saying, no, that will, he in, made that will invalid, and he gave me a will instead that I must be distributing. And the next person comes and say, well, no, he gave me a will instead. That will that you make with him was invalid. And there were over five people that one individual had made a will for each one of them. And therefore, the validity of the will was dependent on whom that will was made with that was of the latter of the date in which those the wills were prepared. And in such a case, there is some level of deception because the individual did not state that he had made will with every other person or the person in the condition that they were in themselves. That individual was not capable of actually understanding everything that was going on. So an old person, and understand this, if your children are out, each one of them individually to outsmart each other in getting the benefit out of a will, and then not in, in, involved in understanding what is the, the ramifications and the, 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 the destruction that they're putting to themselves and to their, their, their individual parent, be it the mother or the father, in preparation of a will, and every one of them try to take a time out and prepare up and write up a will and go and get stand by a lawyer or someone else, and each one of them take, take I, I will take that to the doctor today. Why well, I will take mommy to the doctor today. And in the interim, they went and they make their own will. And the next one do the same thing, and the next one did the same thing. And now we end up with everybody having a will from daddy, but daddy didn't know or mommy didn't know from the beginning to the end, what they're signing, what they're doing, and what they were preparing themselves with. Now, Islamically, Islamically, that type of behavior, that type of attitude is totally out of the pale of Islam. And therefore, all of those wills that were done, not with the consciousness or the awareness of the individual who was preparing the will or signing off on the will, basically, I would say, then that will be like, like robbing the person or, or taking or usurping the rights of that individual without their knowledge or without their consciousness of understanding what they were involved in. And many cases we know exist like that amongst the elders and they die and go and, and, and they leave behind what happens, what schemish attitudes are developed amongst their family or their relatives. And that's what happened. And I have seen cases where not even the family get involved. Some people on the outside, Muslim people, take other people who are old and are living by themselves and then my parents and I leave them in the house, went and take up the people and carry them out and have them with them and looking after them in a particular kind of way, not knowingly and in the manner unknowingly that they were in, in looking to get one thing, to get them to sign over their will and their inheritance in a particular way that the property becomes theirs. And lo and behold, when both parents died, children did not even know that this was happening. They did not even have an awareness, subhanAllah, that this was existing and this, this was done. So when they come to look for their properties, they were actually, you know, they lost their property that was supposed to be handled as inheritance. All of these scenarios and cases do exist invalid wills but yet in the laws of the land they still look valid and they look as sound why because people make about and around about around the minds and behavior of those who are preparing wills so we must consider that invalid even though it may look to be valid in the laws of the land 
but the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah, it does not have no merit. A next proposition and situation. An individual should include in his or her will debts owed to him or her so that they can re be covered for inheritance. In a similar manner, he must also make, in a similar manner, he must also make known those debts which are owed to him or her and are forgiven. This must be done while in good health for its validity. If done in sickness, that results in death. It may be overlooked or not considered in the will. Similar will the case be will be the case of a woman during childbirth. She cannot will nor give forgive debts at that at this time. If she passes away during this time, her instructions will not be carried out. If, however, she regains consciousness, then the statements made by her can be validated and then deemed valid. And understand this is a real important point here because what we are looking at here is that we are looking at a person in a will, right? In a situation here that they are actually having a will, but people making claims on the will that they may not be valid or someone who you owe money or money is owed to you and you have not made those things clear before on your will whilst you are sane and you can do that do it whilst you are alive look I, this person is owing me x amount of money for the last 10 years and i expect him to pay it off before i die if i should die before that then well know that this money is owed by this individual to me other than that, if a person, you owe money, then you have to also make that clear on the will and it is due by this time. So we must make clear on our wills those things that are owed to us and those things that we owe and the due dates that they are to be fulfilled and what sums they are and how they are to be paid and in what manner they are to be repaid. If, however, for example, nowadays, systems of loans and, and these types of things are no longer like we take them for a week or a month, but nowadays people would go into a, 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 a situation of a loan, sometimes for 20, 30, 40 years of their life, right? And, and some of them take it at their working stage of their life and it might be around 25 years and they're starting to earn a living and they're purchasing a home and they have a loan for X amount of money that will be recovered or be paid in the period of 40 years. And who knows if you live for the next 40 years paying out loans. So a list of these loans must be made clear. And if that person is paying a loan for a home or a mortgage, as you will say, and that comes into effect and a person dies and they're still owing on their mortgage, right? That becomes part of the will that must be sorted out. Whether we pay out that debt, sell the property, whether the children decide that we will pay off the debt collectively because the worth of the property is much more than what is remaining on the debt as part of the residue, what is remaining as the wealth, and what is of the debt and what is owed is of a different amount. Those things have to be considered. Those are things that must be considered in your will because if we do not stay these things, then and we leave out these things, the will itself can be say, look, I have $3 million, but you're actually owing $2 million. We never mention about the $2 million or $2.5 million that you're owing. Right? And you die, and children think, well, they have $3 million, and the those of the collect, you're making will for this person to was here to get of this one third, their $1 million and $2 million to be shared amongst your family. Well, and you leave out debts. And after they you distribute everything, and now someone says, look, I make this claim on this. So you say, well, the person never said about this. My, my father never told me he owing $2 million. He never told me he's owing $2 million. So what are we going to do in this case? What are we going to do in this case? Then the will is invalid because the, the, the proof must come, one, that this person is actually owing this one. Two, the other aspect is that the person proves out of it that actually 
what is mentioned to us is that the validity of that will now is dependent on what the proofs are given to us. So if there's law that a person actually have these in financial instruments or business taken place, where it can be proven via a bank or via some financial institution or whether some individual has witnesses who want to take a loan and have signed off. And that's why when you're giving loans, we just give loans, but give it with some level of validity and proof so that that person or that individual can, can have some level of redress. And many of us, you know, we give loan because you're a partner, what are you going to do? You know, I, I, I don't, not worry, no man, if anything happens, is it. Some cases, a person will give a loan and say, well, don't worry. You make it clear. You as an individual have to make it clear and understand this part of it. If a person gives a will, prepares a will, and he says, listen, I know that you, I owe you X amount of money. If I die, you can claim. But if the individual states it, look, listen, listen, if you die, I don't want the money. I will forgive you the dividend. Let that person put that in writing for you so that you can leave it somewhere and say, look, I owe this amount of money, amount of money, but the person says, if circumstances come and you cannot repay this amount of money, and I know you don't want to sell your land to replace, I don't want to sell the property, you have children and so on, I will forgive you the debt. Put that in writing and that will be okay to fulfill that type of, of arrangement or agreement. Sometimes in our modern society now, if we are doing banking, we know that most loans that people take out, usually they are covered by um, a life insurance policy. So a person takes a loan, and I'm not saying whether it is valid or not, or whether it is halal or haram. What I'm saying to you here is for us to understand what the circumstance is when it comes to dealing with having a valid will and having debts. What we are looking at is a scenario where a person owes money to the bank, and the bank has a life insurance policy on you, on that loan. So if you die, that policy covers the loan. They have no redress to you or your family or anyone else. Even that must be made clear to you based on that policy so that you don't get into, in, into uh, entanglement with the bank or with any financial institutions or any individual if that be the case. Because those things can affect the will in its validity it's invalid because it cannot be left out because those are situations that must be known to the individuals who are entitled to receive from your will and those are going to benefit in the terms of what's here of the one third and therefore whatever is of residue and of value to your will and assets as the case would be therefore make clear these types of complications when it comes to debts that are owed and those who owe you. Moving on, you can hold on the questions because maybe inshallah if you have questions, in the last 10 minutes, I'll leave room for a little bit of questioning inshallah. Now, looking at point number three, and we're looking at in making our see our will, an individual, an individual states that a certain individual must do his or her janaza. It must be, I must be buried at a particular spot in a particular town, country, next to a certain person. My, and any of my coffin be of it, and my coffin may be of a certain material and color, and my grave must be constructed with bricks, and a doom be built over it, and to have a half is read the Quran all the time for blessings to ease punishment or whatever may come my way, such a will is invalid. And the person carrying out such instructions will be committing sins. All right? Person carrying out such instructions will be committing sins. Understand what can invalidate your will. Nobody can make these types of things. And even though people might say, well, you know, he says so. He wants... When, when we live in that, we should have a music truck. We should have dress up in a, a different kind of suit or some kind of different thing. Or you want this thing or you want that type of thing. No. Islamic obligations of that nature cannot be placed on a will. We cannot take the money or bestow, as you say, or instruct your person who is going to execute the will 
the executor to fulfill such an obligation because that person will be committing a sin. Why? Because the Quran indicates to us how our wealth should be distributed, how our wealth should be distributed. We are not the ones privy to how to change or to add to it. What it tells us is about debts owed or what you owe. What it tells us is that you have wanted to be given in a beneficial cause for you for the hereafter. It does not say to build a doom or walls or construct brick around a cemetery or which cemetery you should be buried in or what type of a cloth you should be buried in because those choices have no benefit to the individual. They cannot serve to benefit you in any way. So therefore following that prescribed manner of what is dictated in our will will cause the will to become invalid and you have no benefit out of that will. Why? Because that is not part of an Islamic guideline. It is not part of the Islamic guidelines. So therefore, we should not make a will with those things in it. I mean, might I add, you know, you can't make a will and say, well, I don't want this person to attend my funeral, or I don't want a person to cross my house or my pathway. We can't even make a will for those things either. Well, who should attend my funeral? Which number of people should be at my funeral? No, none of those things can be part of Islamic law inheritance in preparation of the will. Now, continuing, let's look at point number four, which says to us, a will can become, a will can become into disrepute if individuals takes from the wealth of the deceased, gives it away in accommodation while the deceased was sick and unable to help him or herself. In a like manner to give away the food materials of the deceased with the hope of him getting blessings will not be permissible since it is all considered inheritance of the deceased, even the clothes of the sick, the clothes of his or her back, and will be considered depriving the heirs, the ones who inherit. Now understand here the clearly, what is mentioned there, you have no control while this person is sick to do whatever you want to do with his money. Now this is different to a person, <clears throat> for example, he has his wealth, but his own family members, this is when you refer to his own family members, right? Those are personally close to him who has his wealth and does without his constructions. Now, if his wealth was given to a financial institution, like a home of an age, in fact, financial institution, in fact, a home to look after this individual, or an individual has given the responsibility to look after the rights of this individual, to look after the needs of this individual. This person has been given an opportunity to look after them and says, listen, I am going to look after this person and therefore whatever he has must be given to look after and take care of him. And in that process now, the money that is given to him or entrusted to him to look after this person, whether he's, he's collecting national insurance or some kind of benefit, no matter what it may be, all of it accumulated together is going to be a source of benefit to the individual looking after the individual because this was what was arranged and the person agreed to this manner beforehand and this was done while the person was in a state of consciousness now if the person becomes unconscious during that process while this action of, was done and the agreement was made nothing is wrong because the person is actually utilizing the wealth for the benefit of the individual and for themselves in the relationship of looking for him in looking after him whether it is directly or indirectly no, a person on the other hand, like the family members who say, well, look, I have to carry this person to the, to the hospital or I came to the doctor, but I about to take the money and buy a car. So I could use it now to go to, the, to, to take him to the doctor. No, buy a car, buying a car to go to the doctor, you know, amazing, Aji, because I mean, a person can just buy a car to take you to the doctor because, you know, it, what you're looking at is because you're trying to benefit out of the man's remaining wealth by buying a car with it. Or if I say, you know, I want to do something of an extreme nature then with the wealth. So we can't go to the extremity, but however, if you want to make accommodation for the person to stay or to improve the environment that he is in, 
or you want to offer something of benefit to him, like extra food or extra medical care, somebody to massage the individual, however it may be, these things will be permissible and allowed to take place. All right, so you can benefit out of that. So we, we will recognize and understand that a person's wealth cannot just be given or utilized why is there nothing in the stuff consciousness? All right, so we have two number fours, and this we have to ignore one of them. Number four again B, the will may be my, of a minor or insane is invalid under the rules of the Sharia. So the will of by a minor or the insane, meaning a person of Balik, or an insane person is invalid under the rules of the Sharia. So no person who doesn't have sound knowledge in terms of, of, of the way you know, the person is mad. In that will person is insane, they cannot make a will because they can will anything and they, because they have no control over their mind. They can say this is their property or that is their property, but it may not be their property. And they're just making a will. A minor can also do the same thing. They're not, they're not, all minors are, of, are not of a sound nature of mind, but Islam in the Sharia and in the law gives that privilege for us to understand that we shouldn't take advantage of a situation like that. It is not obligatory to execute it even within the limit of one third. In a like manner, it will be said that the a sane and adult has the right to make a will against his property of the funeral expenses and the debts should be, go, should be good enough to help execute that will within the mandatory limit of one third. Now, that could be okay. Utilize one third of the world to take care of his debts and his needs and so on. And that kind of but really, the wealth of such a person, a minor, or an individual in that nature should go towards the direct heir who will in benefit out of it. And they have to consider that this person could not give things in terms of how he chooses his one third of the wasia because of the age one or because they've been insane. However, don't take advantage of that wealth because we are accountable for that as well. So we should know that we will get a portion of it, but don't leave them to be deprived. And there are many people I have seen like this as well, situations like this, where it's individual cannot help themselves. But under such circumstances, people take advantage of them and utilize their wealth and keep the people in them in that particular condition. Because they are, for example, people who are, you know, they're insane to some extent, but they receive some government grants and they have some special thing that was left for them amongst the heirs and their, their, their parents and say, because my child cannot function as a real individual and fit into a society, I've left certain proportion of wealth for them. Sometimes these, these people are taken advantage of because they have some level of money and some level of means. And therefore we should never bear that burden, not in this life, not for the life of the hereafter. All right, we move on to page five. And this trip, if we get on to the uh, next point of what a will might be valid or invalid. So, if the will is made for more than one third, meaning the wasia, that portion which we can give out to heirs, the heir can, those who are to inherit the, inherit the heirs, they can invalidate it or they can, by due consideration and concession, allow the limit to exceed or work only to the limit of one third. So that is also part of what is considered when you check the residue, what is the well that is accounted for in the person's will after debts, then only what is written there, what is of value to one third can be distributed or the amount, all of it that is written in the one third, as supposed to be one third, maybe it might cross beyond the one third, then the individuals who are to receive say, look, this is my father, he, 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 you know, let him, whoever wants to take it, because he has already made an intention to do this, let him do it, inshallah, Allah will reward him for it. If not, it is also within their right to say, listen, we are deserving of this, but this is what my father wishes after this one third. It can only be one third according to what is allowed in the Sharia, and we are going to stick by the Sharia. That is also a valid position. So to make it that will valid or invalid or invalidated by that wanted, once it wanted in exceeds the residue, the amount of wealth that is left behind, then in such a condition, that individual, that person must bear in mind that the residue that is left, if it crosses the wanted, 
that is supposed to be utilized, then they can they can validate the will or they can give allowance and allow the will to be valid. So it's it's not a tricky point, but it's just a matter of consideration in what the individuals are willing to give into. Now I would leave the 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 last ten minutes here a little room for discussion because the, in the first session we didn't I didn't leave any room for discussion. And if you want to ask any questions, you can ask now as I would continue inshallah as well. So if you want you can ask and maybe I'm sure it's gonna be yeah. Options you have available to ask any questions. All right, so um Okay, so we just continue again, inshallah, for some more time. Looking at rule number, next option available to us, number six. You can ask in the meantime if you want, you know, you can, um, yeah. So let's look at six in the, in the meantime, inshallah, and at number six. It tells us if the amount of debt owed by the deceased is so high that its payment leaves nothing of the inheritance, then everything, the will, whatever the nature is redundant and invalid, maybe the debtors forego some of the debts of the deceased owed to them and this leaves some property open for distribution. The will is to be applied to the remainder, to, sorry, to the remainder up to the limit of one third, and the rest will go to the heirs, uh, those who will inherit. Now, bearing that in mind, it, it, it's very clear. If you owe more than what you actually have in terms of what they call your residue, what you actually consider to be your wealth, then the debtors can they can forgive go some portion of the owner take all they can take all, but if you owe more than you own, that's a serious problem because then you have to find some way to pay off the rest of debt, right? And for the validity of a will, you can will everything, but if you have nothing to give or you owe everything beyond what you own, then you have a problem that will cannot be valid because debt supersedes. The Quran makes it clear that one must fulfill those things. At dying, he says. Public crime mentions, and before that person can inherit Nawasiya, you saw Biha Audain. One must fulfill and pay off his debts. You saw Biha Audain. And then after we can look after any other aspect of, 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 of receiving or benefiting out of that individual. Don't take it too lightly and tell yourself, well, I, I could, um, you know. Well, I benefit of this man will. So some people might be billionaires or millionaires and have real thinking that they have real money in their hand. You know, you look at what they have and you're thinking that they have real money. But the real fact that remain that they don't have any money. They don't have anything with them. And when you look at what they they, they, they are they are entitled to in terms of wealth, they really don't have anything at all. So in such a case, in such a case, you know, when everything is paid out. That same millionaire might become a person who is a pauper, not only for this life, but they are owing people even after leaving this world. So debts are something that we sh should worry us by day and night if we take beyond our means, we are living beyond our means in terms of what we borrow. Now, saying that, it is also important to note that we should not get ourselves or our family involved in these things. And we should always remember, if I borrow, if I take a loan to pay off some debt or some means, I would state to myself very clearly, listen, if I die, sell this, sell that, sell off whatever it is, pay off my debts, and if you have anything after, well, they will do it. Otherwise, help all yourself. Otherwise, look, I couldn't do anything better. Because sometimes people take debt to live a comfortable life or to allow their families to have a comfortable life, and they die without even paying their debts. And then, and as I said, some people say, well, look, well, I have insurance to cover that, and I have insurance to cover this, and insurance to cover that, and all that kind of things. What type of a life is really that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
in respect to preparation of leaving this world. Because if we have not done the things that are supposed to be done to secure ourselves and our living here and leaving deaths, we are actually leaving our lives in suspension for the hereafter. So if the will, if the will is made for a particular plot of land, house, cloth, domestic animal, or something else, and which went out of his or her ownership, somehow or wasted or something else, and which went out of his or her ownership, somehow or wasted, and the person ought to die, then the will becomes invalid because the particular thing for which the will was made does not exist anymore. Whether it was, uh, he had a horse, and he say, I, I have 10 horse, and I have a herd of cattle, and I have a, a duck pen, I have a pen full of chickens, and put that on the will. You know, if, if, if I die, that pen of chicken will go for you, boy, or, or whoever it is for the masjid or something. But before you die, you know, all the chicken died, or you died, and all the chicken died. So what happens to the will if the will is made for a particular plot of land, house, clothes, domestic animals, and all of these different types of things, etc., which went out of his ownership, somehow wasted, or the person died, or whatever it may be, then the will, will becomes invalid for that particular item or commodity. All right? It can even cause the entire will to become invalid, dependent on how it is looked at in the will. All right. If it was just a residue matter, then it, look, it becomes, in terms of the persons who are inheriting amongst the children, then the children, that part of the will now being what is assessed as an asset or residue, will be coming out of the whole entire situation. If it was left within the, turn to, the one third of the wasia, meaning from what your choice and desire was, then it's no longer there, it is no longer valid. It has no benefit in the will. So it is taken out, it's invalid. So you can't say, well, look, well, this man leave this to me. I had to get something else for compensation, meaning as a gift then. You have to give me something else to replace that, okay? And that cannot be right. That cannot be right. Okay, so we, inshallah, would stop at this point today. I would like just that, inshallah, we encourage others to be part of the program, inshallah, and the classes, because we need to have a set, in a way, inshallah, we can able to register the names of the students. So if you all want, and I mentioned on last class, I would like you, to, you all you know, submit your names for the course. And those who are not here this evening, there were a number of them from last class. Maybe there's something went wrong and they're not being present in class today. Let us take time, inshallah, to um, encourage those who are supposed to be in class with us, inshallah, to join the class, to be part of the class, to be part of it, inshallah. So may Allah SWT reward you all, inshallah, and bless you all for taking the time out to join and to be part and parcel of the entire class, inshallah. Jazakallah mukhair.